Professor Dr. Stefan, it's a great honor to welcome you uh, for this exclusive interview. Thank you very much for the invitation, and it's my pleasure to be with you here for an interview. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we would like to know, actually, based on, 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 this, uh, on this amazing potential, you have been leading uh, a team of over 100 researchers. You have been supervising over 40 global projects. What, what, what could you tell us, for example, what are the major findings out of this, let's say, uh, last 25 years of experience in, in the domain of global warming? The last 24 years, actually, I was at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and I was a professor in atmospheric science, geography, and I was in the later part, the last eight years, I directed CIRIS, which stands for the Coptive Institute for Research in Environmental Science. Mm -hmm. And we had roughly 750 people working worldwide on the aspects of environmental climate change, adaptation, geology. So it's a very broad field if you look at the environment. It's very hard to summarize all the projects because you mentioned all these researchers worked on in different fields, but it might be important to mention some aspects. We have a data center within our institute, the National Snow and Ice Data Center. They are monitoring the extent of sea ice on a daily basis. When you go on, on the computer, on the web today, that is the authority of where do we stand with the decreasing ice extent on the polar ocean, because if we have through the global warming, the ice gets thinner and it gets less reflective. And this became very alert. So this is an output from the Institute to show not only in scientific papers or scientific journals, but to the public mm -hmm. what is happening in the environment. And the Arctic region, where I have worked over 30 years, actually, I've gone to the Arctic every year for expeditions. This is a place you can see change mm -hmm. because it's a very sensitive environment for small changes. And since we have seen changes over the last two decades, it becomes very visible that sea ice is retreating, that the ice sheet is melting, the glaciers are retreating. But these are only a few aspects. And this is environmental science bringing the physical measurements together with the interpretations. What impact does new technology and the, the new favorable political context uh, have as a uh, constructive and tangible impact on, uh, on, 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 on trying to reduce the effects of global warming? Um, do you believe that with technology where we could solve better some of, some of the, the, the issues that we have? I'm a true believer in technology because I think technological development, we are always trying to invent. Mm -hmm. We cannot change or solve all the global change, global climate problems with technology, because there's a problem of production. But there are hopes we can actually reduce some of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, for example, by simply taking it out. Currently, technology is not that well developed, but we can develop better wind turbines, Mm -hmm. better solar panels. I just came back a week ago from Antarctica and that is the Belgium station from my good friend Alain Hubert and he put up the first free carbon research station in Antarctica. The entire energy is produced by wind turbines and by big solar panels. Ten years ago everybody would have said not possible. If you have to will, you can do it. Technology is here. And the industry are actually sending now the new versions of the solar panels down there to be tested in a very extreme environment mm -hmm. because they want to learn how does it work. So I think we can optimize the gain of energy in our environment, but we cannot solve everything with technology. So therefore, behavior. you have to exactly you have to go back to the root. Mm -hmm. How do we use energy? Mm -hmm. And we have to be more careful using it because we can produce energy relatively cheap with coal, but we might want to use another means to generate it and use the coal for something else and not for the energy production. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that you've heard about Aquama and what we're trying to do. Uh, we have um, we are trying very very hard to provide a, a, a magnificent solution which will allow you to not only contribute in a very, uh, in a very tangible way towards uh, uh, um, 
uh, 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 more favorable conditions to, to, to help the environment actually be uh, preserved for our future generations. So we're creating something that we consider to be extremely unique, uh, and it is the fact that we're trying to provide a model which we would call technological. So it's actually uh, trying to provide solutions that will allow you to uh, uh, basically uh, make money through ecology. Uh, do you feel that this will be uh, something that uh, uh, people will uh, will uh, will uh, realize the impact? Do you feel that uh, that this is something that we should uh, push more and more? And uh, what do you think actually about the concept in general? Let me first very, be very general. I think a good business model you always make some money, <laughs> and I hope you will be successful there because. Even more important, if you can have a model that is ecologically viable, I think this is great. Because our entire population, you know population growth, we all need more of our resources. Using resources means we actually have more pollution. Mm -hmm. And if you can develop new technology, new uh, solvents that actually don't pollute the environment, you are one step ahead of the curve. And I think that's where we have to go with all our application. Say it with water, say it with using energy. I think that is the new model. We have to be very innovative to come up with solutions that have the least impact on our environment because population will grow, but our environment is still the only place we have. Exactly. We cannot just move over to Mars, to Mars. or to Moon. <laughs> this is our Earth. And we have to share it. Mm -hmm. Our future has to share it. Our kids. Mm -hmm. I'm more concerned that our kids will not have the same environment mm -hmm. that I grew up. I know already because they're already 22 or 25. But their kids might see it very different. Mm -hmm. And it starts actually with the use and the development. And I think technology is part of a solution because if you can create something that uses less energy or less pollution, that is the way to go. And that's why I'm very supportive for the idea because I can see the, it is beneficial for the environment. If you even can make some money, even better because then the product stays online. Yeah. If it's not viable, it will go off the shelf. Yeah. Well, that's the intention. <laughs> Actually, this is this is uh, almost the end of our interview. There is one last question, uh, which is actually one of the most important: is that we are so uh, uh, ecstatic about the fact that you're coming back to Switzerland after so many years of uh, these great achievements, uh, and we have heard about some of the new challenges that uh, you are prepared to tackle, and uh, we would like to hear about some of uh, some of the new responsibilities, the projects that you will be. Uh, handling and managing in Switzerland. Could you share with us some of this information or is it confidential? No, no, it's not confidential. I'm actually a federal employee now. Oh. <laughs> so information is public. I came back to be the director of the Swiss Federal Research uh, Institute, VSL, which is basically the terrestrial environment, mm -hmm. which has offices in Zurich is the main office. We have in Davos the big office that has all the avalanche forecast, all the snow research. We have an office in Lausanne with EPFL, we have an office in Sion, we have an office wow. in Bellinzona. So we are roughly 500 plus researchers, people, grad students. And big challenges are we have a mandate from the government because we are a government research lab. One of the mandates is, besides doing basic research, forest. Mm -hmm. How, what's the health of the forest in Switzerland? And the health of the forest in Switzerland depends on the climate. And currently we can actually see large areas in the valley, in the valleys, mm -hmm. getting drier and drier. Mm -hmm. The kind of forestry we had there was there for hundreds of years. It will be changing. Mm -hmm. We have to find out what's the best cover, because forest is not just there to look at green trees. Of course. Forest has a function, mm -hmm. a very important function to actually take the carbon out of the atmosphere, put it into the soil, or protect areas from avalanches. Mm -hmm. It is an environment where people can relax. So it is really part of our system. But how can we maintain simply the forest in a changing climate is a big issue. Mm -hmm. That's where we have a lot of people working on, among many others. Ecology is an important one. Then the growth of population. We have seen a huge influx in Switzerland 
because it is a very attractive place to work, not only to ski. Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> it is still very welcome to foreigners mm -hmm. because I see that I have a lot of my friends are foreigners. They work with me. It's a great environment. Mm -hmm. But growing means the people need to live somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know Switzerland is rather small. Mm -hmm. We have one third of mountain. You can't sleep on a mountain top. <laughs> we have areas of you can't be on a lake. So space gets limited, mm -hmm. but we still need areas where we have recreation. And so you have competing issues, landscape and urban areas. Mm -hmm. And that has to actually be solved on a longer term. You cannot wait until you have to make a decision. You have to do much, do much longer planning. We help in that process. So we don't only have researchers that do physical science, we have human researchers as well, because we are part of the equation. Of course. Human beings. Of course. So you have to understand human beings, how they react if we propose a change. So we have to illuminate the problems from multiple angles. These are just a few examples. But it's exciting. It's nice to be back. Of course. I really enjoyed it. Even a lot of my friends said, can you go back after 24 years? My simple answer was, I think Switzerland became much more international and it became much more friendlier. Yeah.